We have a massive dual filament launch that could give Earth a glancing blow. And a departing region on the Sun's west limb fires a big X-class flare and bathes Earth in a radiation storm. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week continues to give us some great eye candy, but there's not been a lot that's been Earth-directed. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we have been paying re attention to region 4079 and 4086. We were hoping that they would give us some really good flares while on the Earth-facing disk, but it really hasn't manifested until later. We'll get back to that in a second. We've also been hoping to get some fast solar wind from these coronal holes, but that also hasn't manifested all that much. All we've been getting is a bumpy ride over the past few days. But the interesting thing is that take a look at these long filaments, especially this one right here. This one, starting around the 11th, really started getting active and began to really get activated and lifted off. You'll see it whoosh along with another filament. We'll see it here in close-ups. You can actually see this little tether right here kind of break off. And as soon as it breaks off, this whole thing begins to lift off. And you'll see another filament on the sun's far side. And they kind of lift off as like these gorgeous bird wings. Watch this. It's just absolutely stunning. Just the sheer size of these two filaments lifting off. Look at that. Just unbelievably beautiful. But on top of that, you'd think that this was just going northward, but believe it or not, the scar from this thing, as it lifted off the sun, you can see where it tore off the sun. We change color here, and you can actually see the scar burning clear down in here, which makes us think, well, maybe there's part of this that's Earth-directed. In fact, when we take a look at coronagraphs, you can actually see this. It's not really a partial halo, but watch this lower edge here keep creeping down. That's almost mid-disc here, so we could get a glancing blow, and we'll talk more about that as we take a look at prediction models. Meanwhile, as we look back at the disc, Believe it or not, Region 4086, finally, watch it here. Pow! Look at that gorgeous eruption. This was a massive eruption. It was actually an X1.2 class flare and caused an R3 level radio blackout uh, on the Western Hemisphere. You can see it right there. It also caused a really big eruption, you can see, along with the radiation storm. Look at that thing right there. So we've got some decent activity and it's continuing to be active on the sun's far side, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit here. Meanwhile, while what we're going to get ready for next week is that this coronal hole is returning into Earth view, so that could give us some more chances for some fast solar wind. And we've got not just this region, but another two regions rotating into Earth view over the next maybe three to five days. And those regions look like they're growing pretty fast on the sun's far side. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Now, switching to the far side of our sun, this is Stereo A, and we're back to looking at Stereo A because it's actually moved to the sun's far side, just off to the edge of Earth anymore. So here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A looking at the sun just a little bit from the side. And as we kind of calibrate ourselves, you can see region 4079 and 4086. These two regions are the ones that are actually being very active on the sun's far side. In fact, as they rotate to the sun's far side, it's really region 4086 that continues playing pretty hard here and expecting to see probably more big solar flares from it. And now switching to our full sun map, luckily we have SDO AIA that's Earth side so we can get an idea. That's what we see here in red. But we also have solar orbiter EUI imagery of the sun's far side because solar orbiter is on the sun's far side right now. That gives us a whole sun idea of what kind of active regions might be lurking and growing on the sun's far side. And as I set this in motion, you can see region 4079 
49 and 40, 86, that should calibrate you a bit, so you know that's Earth side. But then on the sun's far side, you can see region 40, 64. This is the region that has just rotated into Earth view and has become region 40, 87. But we also have a new region developing right there, as you can see, that has yet to rotate into Earth view. And if you watch region 40, 73, it's also being a bit active. So it's growing a little bit there. So we expect to have more activity here over the next couple days. And then again, in about three to five days, as some of these new regions rotate back into Earth view and, of course, are firing off big solar flares. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect to have more activity rise here over the next maybe three to five days, including bigger chances for radio blackouts and, of course, more noise on the rate day side radio bands. Now, returning to that partial uh, Earth-directed filament eruption that we saw earlier with the big bird wings, we switched to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NASA's version of the model. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as I set this solar storm model in motion, you're going to see that solar storm barely be launched. You can see it a lot better here in the vertical cut because that solar storm, remember, was launched pretty much northward. But believe it or not, there's a little bit of something that looks like it's going to graze Earth right around early on the 16th. In fact, when we take a look at our impact footprint here, you can see it's just going to be on the north side of Earth. This is north pointing this way. So this is just north of Earth. So we could get a bit of wake from this structure as it passes by. If it's any larger than, I and mean, this thing's pretty big, so the chances of it being large enough to give us some type of disturbance is pretty good. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitude, well, you could get a little bit more of a bumpy ride than what we've been given, not expecting to get a whole lot from it, but it might be worth a look. Now, stepping outside to take a look at our current conditions with our global geochron map, you can see we're actually dealing with a bit of a radiation storm, and this was due to that R3 level radio blackout that we had from that X-class flare, but it hasn't been all that bad. We haven't reached S1 levels, but we might here over the next day or two, so we have to be a little bit careful. You amateur radio operators are likely dealing with a little bit of noise on the bands, and those who are dealing with GPS reception know that you might have issues with navigation at the high latitudes here over the next couple days. Now, as we take a look at Aurora, well, we haven't been getting any big solar storms or Earth directed, but we have been getting a bit of a bumpy ride, a lot of just little disturbances here and there. And that's caused the Aurora to build just a little bit, but it's been reasonably mild. So again, high latitude stuff, just a little bit. Now, you'd expect that that would affect our scintillation risk for higher frequencies like GPS. But according to the Roti scintillation risk map, you know, we're not expecting we're not seeing stuff at high latitudes, all things considered. It's just kind of random here and there. So uh, all things considered, you GPS users, well, as long as you stay away from dawn and from dusk, your risk for scintillation shouldn't be all that bad. Now, switching to our moon, we are now passing through the full moon phase on our way to a third quarter, and by the 20th, the moon will be about 50% illuminated. So, Unite Sky Watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, well, you're going to have this bright companion, so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are dealing with a bit of a solar storm hit right now. It's not a very big one. It looks like it's mostly kind of gl a glancing blow, but it has been giving us a bit of activity. At high latitudes, we're expecting minor storm conditions, but things should kind of settle down. We might get a little bit of fast solar wind, but then that glancing solar storm that we expect from that big filament eruption, that's going to be hitting around the 16th. We could have up to about a 20% chance of a major storm over the next uh, day, and then things will settle back down. And once again, it's going to be nothing but just kind of like this bumpy ride. So aurora photographers, if you're high latitudes, don't expect a massive show, but you could get a little something from this, so it might be worth a look. Now, as we switch to mid-latitudes, well, we're only expecting unsettled conditions, but we could have up to about a 15% chance of a minor storm starting around the 16th, because we're expecting that filament that dual filament structure to kind of graze Earth right around the 16th. So Aurora photographers, if you're dedicated, it might be worth taking a look. Otherwise, you might want to sit this one out at mid-latitudes because it's likely not going to be all that exciting.
And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the low 100s for solar flux, and that means that we just don't have a lot of active regions that are giving us a lot of solar flux on the day side. Resp that nice thing is that it gives us a lot of uh, respite when it comes to big noise on the day side radio bands. We're sitting at minor noise levels with only about a 15% chance of M-class flares at the R1 to R2 level, and only about a 1 to 5% chance of X-class flares because the region 4086 is now rotated to the sun's far side. Now, likely that's going to continue throughout the rest of this week, but we might see as we go into Sunday and into next week, some of those other regions are rotating into Earth view, so we could see a pickup when it comes to big solar flares. So day side is nice and quiet this week, so enjoy amateur radio operators, but expect next week things will pick back up again. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Right now we're sitting at the D2 minor range. This is at flight level 360. It's also the S0 stormy range for everyone else. We're not quite at the S1 level for radiation storm, but NOAA's giving us about a 70% chance of hitting that S1 to S2 level over the next 24 hours. And that's going to continue to be a risk over the next couple days. It depends upon how quickly that non-Earth directed solar storm that was launched along with that X-class flare, how long it takes for that to kind of clear the area. So expect that you're going to have elevated uh, dose rates until about the 16th, and then things should calm down. So you high-risk passengers, and this does include air crew and frequent flyers, please take this into consideration in your flight plans, and then keep uh, an eye on those ICAO advisories. So the space weather this week is very interesting. We don't have a lot of Earth-directed storms headed our way, just kind of a bit of a bumpy ride. But we had that gorgeous, massive filament eruption. So your roar photographers, if you're at high latitudes, right around the 16th, you definitely could get a boost in the aurora. So it might be worth a look. Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, you know, only if you're dedicated, right? I say it all the time. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, this week, things are getting a bit quieter. You should enjoy a little bit more, uh, you know, quiet on the day side radio bands and less radio blackouts. Although in about three to five days, things are going to pick up again. So just be aware of that. But right now, enjoy the quiet. And now you GPS users, well, you know, we're only going to have a bumpy ride. There hasn't been a lot of aurora going on. And we're not having a, a lot of big issues with uh, radio blackouts. So right now, it's just high latitudes with those with that radiation storm, and once it dies down in a few days, your GPS reception should be absolutely golden. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.